Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Justin Martin. I know it's been a couple weeks since uh, we did our last presentation, uh, but today what I'm doing is, or for my research presentation is I'm going to be talking a little bit about the American chestnut and the science that goes into making sure this tree stays around for the next, hopefully, hundreds of years. Um, now, I know that not everybody in this class may be um, very big on learning about forestry, um, but over the past couple of years, I've developed a very fond uh, appreciation for those that are in uh, forestry in general. Uh, I found it very interesting to learn more about the trees and, you know, trees are always, excuse me, are all around us. Uh, we use the products that come from these trees, from trees in general, every single day, and they help us uh, live our life as we know right now. Um, so the main, that's the main reason I really want, I like focusing on it. I like learning about trees. And today I'm here to go over the research that goes behind um, trying to bring this species of tree back here um, to the eastern part of the United States. Now, um, for a while, just kind of give you back a little bit of background information. Uh, the American chestnut in general has been around for about 10 million years. Uh, up until the past couple of hundred years, uh, just due to our own negligence, we almost wiped out this species of tree completely. Um, and I'll get in more into that and how we did that um, here in just a second. But I wanna give you a little bit of background information about this tree in general. So, like I was saying, this tree's been around for about 10 million years. Uh, a lot of these photos I'll be using in this presentation, some of them are old, some of them are a lot newer. Um, but like I said, I wanna focus on what this tree in general looks like, okay? So as you can see here by this picture on the back of the, on, on the board behind me, this tree in general you may have seen, uh, but the main thing that always stuck out whenever you see this tree is you're always going to see basically a round husk that is full of sharp needles. Um, now, whenever I was younger, uh, a lot of times this tree can also be um, confused with another tree called an Allegheny chinkapin. You may have heard of that, you may not have heard of that, and a couple others as well. But these right here are very hard to get confused with anything else. Um, like I was saying, the Allegheny Chinka Pen and your American Chestnut both have a round husk that has, looks like sand spurs all over it. Um, now, obviously, whenever you're a kid and you want to throw stuff, uh, these right here are probably not the best. Uh, more than likely, you will stab yourself every time you try to pick this thing up. Um, but anyways, this right here is similar to what it looks like. And as you can see up here on the board, uh, these right here are basically the tree, this tree's fruit. Uh, they are round husk. Um, they have spikes or thorns, whatever you want to call it, all around the outside of it. But the main part of this is on the inside of this husk is where the seed is. Um, now, like I was saying, you can kind of get these confused with your Allegheny chinka pen over here. The main difference though, is that the seed on the very inside of this husk for your American chestnuts, it usually has more than one. More than likely you have two to three of those seeds that are inside this husk while your Allegheny Chinka Pen only has one of those seeds. That's the main difference between these. Um, now, in some cases, whenever, what I'll be going into, um, what kind of wiped out our population of American chestnuts, uh, one thing it also did was it kind of hurt the population of Allegheny Chinka Pens a little bit, but the only difference is that the Allegheny Chinka Pen had a better resistance to what you'll be learning about. Um, so, I did just want to go ahead and mention that, uh, but more than likely this right here is almost a dead giveaway of what this tree looks like and one way to tell it apart from others. Okay, so before we go any further, I do want to go ahead and mention as well exactly where do you find these American chestnuts. So here in the U.S. Um, or, you know, years ago, like I said, this tree's been around for millions of years and this tree and its prominence here in the U.S. ranged anywhere from about southern uh, Canada around Ontario all the way down to parts of Mississippi um, it went east as far as parts of North Carolina and then west as far as Ohio um, now it's not in these locations anymore uh, a lot of the population has decreased so much that you'll be lucky if you, lucky if you find these uh, this tree in really any part of these uh, of the US here as you can see on this map but anyways this right here is where it ranged before, um, and then we're gonna go a little bit more into the uses and why, uh, what we use these trees for in general. So, all right, so like I was saying, one big, big difference that we have between all these trees is that at the top you see our Allegheny chinkapin, uh, it only has the one seed on the inside of the husk. 
The uh, American chestnut has anywhere between two to three that are a little bit bigger. And then of course down here at the very bottom, which we'll get into a little bit, your Chinese chestnut, their seed's a little bit bigger, okay? So, <clears throat> now, um, originally, whenever we're talking about the American chestnut, this tree right here was known to be about three to four billion trees um, here in the United States, eastern part of the United States. Um, and then years after that, um, it has decreased. Um, but back then, down there was basically one quarter of all the trees that you have, one quarter to one half of all the trees that we have here in the eastern part of the United States was nothing besides American chestnuts. Now, this right here created a big, um, was a big help for us, um, a lot of the settlers that were here in the United States. It helped them because these trees right here were really known and really good for using for wood, uh, their wood quality was really good. It was used for building, uh, it was used for uh, making fence posts. It was used for siding on, on, on houses and cabins and barns. Um, this tree right here in general was really good for that um, compared to a lot of other trees. Now, besides that, I know some people might remember uh, or you know, got some Christmas carols, Christmas songs that actually talk about the chestnut. Um, and a lot of people use chestnuts as part of a um, kind of like they ate it during certain times of the year. Sometimes they ate it all, all, all year long. Um, a lot of people um, use <clears throat> the American chestnut seeds as a good source of protein for their animals. A lot of hogs, cows, uh, and a lot of farm animals in general were fed American chestnuts just because they had such a high quality of protein um, and fiber within the seed itself. Um, so they use it to put on weight for the animals. Another thing they also use with these is they also use it for furniture. Um, that was also another good quality um, that they could get from these trees. Um, so realistically, this tree is actually what built and made us who we are today. Um, a lot, like I said, a lot of people use these trees. They were very good, but we kind of we shot ourselves in the foot later on. But anyways, before we get there. I also want to mention that this tree right here was such a good quality tree for animals. Um, this right here is known as a keystone species in many different ecosystems. Um, back whenever this tree was all over the place, a lot of animals such as your black bear, your white-tailed deer, as well as also your turkeys relied on your, the seeds that came out of these, uh, out of the husk on these trees as just a way of survival. Um, a lot of these animals ate these in the winter and kind of help get them through um, and whenever this tree started kind of disappearing it affected a lot of ecosystems majorly um, which we'll learn a little more about here too but I did want to go ahead and mention that as well so now um, what I'm going to talk about here is basically just the diseases you know why do we not see this tree as much as what we used to the main reason being is because of the different types of diseases that started affecting these American chestnuts now um, one of these diseases is known as root rot. Now, I know a lot of people have seen, you see this in uh, greenhouses sometimes. You see this really anywhere. The main reason why we see it is because of the type of moisture content that is in the area where certain trees, plants are grown. Um, now, th what this root rot does is it's caused by fungus and it actually affects the roots of the tree in general. It causes them to, or excuse me, it causes processes that occur inside the tree or the plant, bush, whatever it may be, to actually slow down and they don't start growing like they need to be. Um, a lot of common problems that you see whenever you do have root rot is a lot of the leaves on the tree or the uh, plant in general will start wilting and then they'll start turning brown or yellow. Um, and ultimately in the end, the tree or the plant dies. And this right here is one big common occurrence that we saw whenever we had American chestnuts. If it was down in an area there where there was a lot of moisture, um, ultimately that would cause root rot on that tree and that tree would end up dying. But the biggest one that I really want to focus on, the biggest disease that basically made this tree, um, or was basically detrimental to this tree, was known as chestnut blight. Um, now, chestnut blight was actually brought over here to the United States back in the 1860s. Um, and then we started seeing cases of where this chestnut blight actually started affecting our American chestnuts around the 1890 area. Now, what chestnut blight does 
is it actually affects the cam cambium uh, part of the tree itself. So what it ends up doing is it increases the pH of what the tree is. And then in the end, it actually starts killing different parts of the outside layer of the tree. Ms. Conley, please report to the front. Ms. Conley, please report to the front office. Sorry about that. So what, what it actually ends up doing is it increases the pH and it starts killing the cambium layer on the outside of the tree. Uh, now this right here became very detrimental to all of the American chestnut trees here in the U.S. So in a short amount of time, such as 60 years, so we, we originally saw this back in the 1860s, or it was brought over here in the 1860s, or in the 1890s uh, period is when we actually started seeing cases of it. And by 1950, chestnut blight was all over the whole entire range of where American chestnuts grew here in the U.S. Um, before long, it actually started killing off one by one until this tree species became in danger. Um, now, obviously, like I was saying a while ago, people in the area here in the United, eastern part of the United States built their whole life around this tree, you know, using it for the wood and using it for food, um, using it for food for their animals. And in 60 years, we went ahead and almost wiped out this whole entire population of American chestnut trees. Um, and that's basically a tree that's been around for almost 10 million years or around 10 million years. So in 60 years, we almost got rid of it completely. Um, and that's one reason why we're spending so much time now on trying to resurrect, um, or a lot of people and a lot of organizations are trying to resurrect this species of a tree in general. So, I went ahead and put a couple pictures up here. Um, as you can see, um, these right here are very old pictures. Um, and the reason I put them up here is because not too long after we started seeing problems with our chestnut blight, what they ended up thinking was if we go ahead and cut down trees around ones that are infected, then we can go ahead and, you know, we won't have any more problems with it. Um, not too long after that, though, we started seeing more problems. Um, and the main reason why we started seeing more problems is because Chestnut blight in general, um, what it acts, how it gets on the tree is by whenever this tree starts growing, bark on the side of the tree ends up cracking a little bit and chestnut blight gets inside of it. Well, after it gets inside of the bark or on the side of the bark, what ends up happening is spores start to grow from the fungus. Now before long, every time the wind blows, spores um, that are open are released to other plants and trees and chestnut trees in the area and in the end it actually ends up spreading and killing them um, to every chestnut tree in the area. Um, so it's really hard to control, it still really is hard to control and rather than it just being about, or excuse me, what, rather than it just infecting the chestnut trees, it also can affect many other different species of trees such as your oaks, um, well, oaks being the main ones. Um, so what we ended up finding out was some of these trees that ended up dying would eventually come back. Um, what would end up happening is sprouts would actually start coming out of old tree stumps where trees have fallen down, the chestnut trees. And we ended up seeing that some of those would grow back, but some of them would eventually end up just doing this whole process of growing back, dying, growing back, dying for years on end. Um, there are a couple or a few that ended up maybe being a little bit immune to the chestnut blight to where we actually started seeing those trees and they're actually used even today in a lot of the research that goes into are those trees that are still behind them, are they kind of immune to the chestnut blight? Um, so a lot of times that's what we, we see, that's what we see now and that's actually what's kind of driving this whole um, research that is currently uh, taking place up there in Appalachian Mountains um, and other areas up there in that area. So, now one thing I do want to go ahead and mention though is that there's an organization called the um, American Chestnut Foundation. Uh, and they're the main ones that are putting a lot of research and time into figuring out um, the causes of chestnut blight and ways to prevent it in our uh, future populations of trees. Um, so, the main reason um, or the main thing that we ended up finding out from these uh, the chestnuts in general is that whenever this foundation was started back in 1983, um, we ended up finding out that 
there are certain trees that are immune to this ch uh, chestnut bite. One of those being the Chinese chestnut and the Japanese chestnut. Now, like I was saying a while ago, this chestnut blight started in areas over there in Asia and Japan. And then whenever we brought them over here to the US and then it, it started infecting our chestnut population that we have here. Um, the main reason why that happened is because those trees over there are immune to, to, to chestnut blight, but the ones here in America are not. So whenever we brought that blight over, that's, ended up, that's what actually caused our, um, I guess you can consider our vast uh, extermination of uh, our American chestnuts over here from the black. So what we ended up finding out is that ch the Chinese chestnuts have a tolerance to this black. So what we ended up doing was we ended up actually um, some or some people as part of this American Chestnut Foundation ended up actually taking the genes from our American chestnuts and crossing them with genes from our Chinese or or our Asian chestnuts. Um, and what we ended up finding out was that as generations went on, they had a stronger resistance to this chestnut body. So what we ended up coming up with is, after four generations, we ended up coming up with, I know it's hard to see, but we ended up calling, uh, yeah, it's still really hard to see, sorry. Um, but our current uh, hybrid that we have of our American chestnut is actually made up of 94% American chestnut and 6% of the Chinese chestnut. But what we found out is that this tree in general is a lot better suited to grow and withstand this Chinese, uh, or excuse me, this chestnut blight. Um, and that's what we found out, out over years of uh, uh, basically research. So um, what we've ended up doing is in parts of Tennessee, North Carolina, and Virginia, there has been test plants, or excuse me, test plots that have been planted since 2009. In 2009, what we ended up doing was we they planted 4,500 of these American chestnut hybrids in North Carolina, Tennessee, and Virginia. And what we found out was that these new hybrids are actually a lot more immune to this chestnut blight compared to what our normal American chestnuts are. Um, what we ended up finding out was after they planted the 4,500, um, within as little as uh, 12 years, we ended up having, out of that 4,500, we had 2,700 of them left over um, that were still alive that did not die. Now, a lot of times what happened is for the very first year of these chestnuts being alive and growing, they were growing into, in a nursery. So a lot of times the deaths of these chestnuts was a result of moving them from the nursery to the real world. So that's a lot, a majority of the numbers that um, of why it decreased from 45 to 2700. But like I was saying, in about 12 years, all the trees that were, all the hybrid chestnut trees ended up growing in on average about 25 feet in that 12 years. So in general, if you look at it and think about it, um, these hybrids are a lot better suited to be growing in this climate that we have and in their normal range here in the U.S. compared to what the normal American chestnuts that are almost extinct and endangered now do. Uh, do. So, um, as you can see here, uh, about 2,700 or roughly 60% of the trees that were planted are still alive. Um, if we were to compare this, um, and they, the, the, the research that's been going on through the American Chestnut Foundation has found out that they also planted normal American chestnut trees in certain locations whenever they were doing this, these hybrid plantings. And what they found out was that about only 20% of the, 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 the natural American chestnuts are even left over compared to our 60% of the hybrid chestnuts still being alive. So in general, we have about a 40% better um, or 40% um, increase in the amount of the hybrid chestnuts still being alive compared to the normal American chestnuts. So, what we ended up finding out though is that um, all those, that 2700 is still alive um, and they're basically developing a black tolerance um, to our chestnut black. Now, like we were saying, like I just went over, about 20% of the normal American chestnuts are alive out of those test plant plantings. 
Um, but the main thing they also found out is that even though those hybrids do not have a, um, are not affected by the chestnut blight um, as much as what we used to, there, we still have a problem with root rot. But a lot of that can actually be boiled down to the location where these test plots are um, and how much moisture um, is in the soil around that. That's basically the main reason why we have problems with root rot, um, but it's not really a main problem because root rot did not uh, decrease the population at an, an instrumental, uh, or excuse me, a big or large rate compared to what the ch chestnut blight did. So in the grand scheme of everything, there, there's not as big of an issue. Um, but anyways, like I wanna go ahead and say is this right here, this research was done um, by the USDA or in the Forest Service, the US Forest Ser Service, as well as the American Chestnut Foundation. Um, this research is still ongoing. Um, and here in the next couple of years, hopefully a species of tree that was, has been around for 10 million years that we as humans almost got rid of and made extinct and got rid of them completely. Um, if we can go ahead and counteract what we did and make sure that these chestnuts come back and they grow and flourish flourish as much as what they used to, then in the general, our ecosystems are going to be more protected or they are going to uh, flourish uh, more so than what they used to or about the same as what they used to. And then along with that, we can actually have a good quality tree that we can use for wood purposes, for uh, timber, for, you know, for, for furniture for our house. Um, but what it comes down to is like I was saying, it's, it's, it's because we did not care enough from the beginning, we're having to fix what the problems that we created. Um, and that's one thing that I really want to stress and uh, you know, kind of just you know, at least bring awareness to um, our, the foundation such as the American Chestnut Foundation and what they're doing and the research that's going into that. Um, so uh, I really appreciate y'all taking the time and, and watching this. Um, hopefully you've learned a little bit, of, a little bit um, from this presentation. I know I did not want to go ahead and read out every single sentence word, um, but I have included this PowerPoint on, or excuse me, up under the, this video. Um, so if you are interested and you want to learn more about it, I did go ahead and include a little bit of information on there, um, as well as more pictures and so on and so forth. So like I was saying, I really appreciate y'all taking the time and watching this. Um, hopefully I've, I've I've raised a little bit of awareness for our American chestnuts, and hopefully here in the next couple of years, a few years to the next couple of hundred years, we can make sure that this species comes back and we can use it um, for all of its benefits. So uh, thank you again for taking the time and watching this, and I uh, look forward to watching every one of y'all's videos. Um, but thank y'all, and hope y'all have a great day.